Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel for another November video, a series dedicated to film noir, the movement, style or genre that really fascinates us. And today I have for you, I hope, a very exciting movie, one that I definitely love and it is none other than Too Late for Tears, released in 1949 and directed by Byron Haskin. something straight honey that's my dough you're talking about what have you got in the bag it weighs a ton there are no cigarettes in there Alan I think probably someday you will kill me and I wouldn't want that to happen Too Late for Tears is yet another one of those low-budget B-movie film noir classics that I really, really gravitate towards. In this case, particularly for the charismatic performances of Elizabeth Scott and Anne Durie. I didn't know they made him as beautiful as you are, and as smart, or as hard. It is good, I think, to point out before I continue that much like the case of The Prowler, a movie that I talked about a couple of videos ago, Too Late for Tears is another case of a movie that was restored, a movie that was saved, thanks to the collaboration between the UCLA Film and Television Archive and the Film Noir Foundation. And as I said before, this is very valuable work. So right off the bat, I wanted to mention this. I wanted to just express my gratitude to the Film Noir Foundation and UCLA Film and Television Archive for this. But let's get down to business. All right, now let's get seriously to work. Uh -huh. And let's start talking about Too Late for Tears, a movie that was based on a sad Saturday Evening Post serial by Roy Haggins, an author who also wrote the screenplay. He was a very prolific writer and producer who maybe not so much for film noir, but in terms of his contribution for television in the form of highly successful and long-lasting TV shows such as 77 Sunset Street, Maverick, The Fugitive, or The Rockford Files. So his contribution was certainly enormous. In the mid-1940s, he began publishing crime fiction influenced by Raymond Chandler with titles such as The Double Take, also adapted into a film, a Columbia production title I Love Trouble. In Too Late for Tears we have another great femme fatale played by Elizabeth Scott, also this greed and this obsession with money. Even though Too Late for Tears' real attraction is the multiple twists and turns that the story has, how exciting the story is, and how well it is played by the cast. The story presents us a married couple formed by Jane and Alan Palmer, played by Elizabeth Scott and Arthur Kennedy, who in one of those really incredible, unimaginable twists of fate, come into possession of a big bag filled with 60,000 but is it really a gift from heaven in the end or the road to perdition for some of the characters of the story? That's where we're presented here in Too Late for Tears as conflict begins to arise when Jane wants to keep the money and Alan, the husband, wants to do the sensible thing and turn it to the police. In all this powerful mix, we need to add a highlight of too Late for Tears, who is none other than Dan Durier, a fantastic actor who really makes the most of the part he was given in Too Late for Tears. Also in the cast, we have Don DeFore in a rather mysterious part that you get to know more of as the film progresses, and Kristen Miller, who plays Alan's sister, Kathy. Even though, as I said, it was a low-budget film initially, though it was conceived as a bigger production aimed for such big names as John Crawford, Kirk Douglas, and Wendell Corey for the three main characters, but obviously ended up being 
being a much more modest project, independently produced and then released through United Artists. And maybe as a result of that, the film was also not a box office success when it was released, which happens to be normally the case for the films I love the most, as I'm finding out. That's right. That's right. And it was reissued in 1955 with another title, Killer Bait. Byron Haskin, the filmmaker of Too Late for Tears, was also much like Roy Hagen's case a name not particularly associated to film noir, but who at this stage of his career was a veteran professional. He began working as a newspaper cartoonist, and then in cinema he had multiple jobs as a cinematographer, a photographer, an assistant director, and also working on the special effects department where he got to really make a mark, eventually becoming the head of Warner Brothers special effects department for a number of years working on films such as Errol Flynn's The Seahawk and Desperate Journey or Arsenic and Old Lace. He also directed in 1950 Disney's Treasure Island and 1953's George Pal's production of The War of the Worlds and The Naked Jungle, a personal favorite. And finally, in film noir, he also got to direct a movie like I Walk Alone, starring Burt Lancaster, Elizabeth Scott, with a supporting cast featuring Wendell Corey and Kirk Douglas, probably the cast intended for Too Late for Tears. But I'm not complaining because, as I said, the cast of this movie has the glorious presence of Dan Duryea in one of my favorite performances of his. And what can I say about Dan Duryea, really, that he was a wonderful, wonderful actor who tended to always play this sleazy, super charismatic heel in most cases, and also an actor who wore hats, who wore fedoras, probably just as good or almost just as good as Dana Andrews did. He is wonderful here, as I said, with his part of Danny Fuller, a man who comes to claim the money that quite randomly has fallen into the hands of Jane and Alan Palmer. Initially, he seems to be the one ahead of the game, but as it would later turn out, he has to face Elizabeth Scott, who is a superb piece of work in Too Late for Tears. At this point of her career, she had already left an indelible mark in film noir with films such as The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, Dead Reckoning, or as I mentioned before, I Walk Alone. And even though, in my opinion, she was probably not as charismatic as other actresses, still in a film like Too Late for Tears, she got to create a femme fatale who is really smooth, as at one point Dan Duryea's character points out. You're too smooth, honey. You're much too smooth. A really smooth operator here who is really passionate, let's put it that way, about keeping the money that has fallen into her hands, but who also, in a way I feel, is able to reflect a frustration that women felt, a powerlessness that women with aspirations had, who were also socially and financially subjected to men, to their husbands in this case. It's the way I am. You've got to let me keep that money. Don't, don't you? No, Alan. I won't let you just give it away. Chances like this are never offered twice. This is it. I've been waiting for it, dreaming of it all my life, even when I was a kid. Scott in Too Late for Tears plays this to an extreme and thus creating again, in my opinion, one of her best performances. And also the third party in all this entanglement is none other than Arthur Kennedy, also a character actor, a wonderful character actor, whom I am also used to seeing as the bad guy in most movies. But in Too Late for Tears, he plays the husband. Also in film noir, men also show their own frustrations and limitations. That is something that is embodied by both Arthur Kennedy and Dan Duryea very well in Arthur Kennedy's part. The way he wants to give the money back seems to be operating more on a default mode rather than by a core set of values. Almost out of fear, showing the monotony and oblivious way of operating. And that is something, again, that Arthur Kennedy is able to portray with great conviction. He always, always provides fantastic performances when he also did play play these more loving characters, such as in another great B-movie like The Window. And even though I feel he has not much 
supposed to go with in terms of the character and his scenes in the movie. And he's always a much welcome presence. Cinematography was by William C. Mellor, yet another veteran of his craft who had had a very long career ranging from the 1930s right until his last movie the greatest story ever told by george stevens a director he worked with several times in highly influential films such as a place in the sun or giant and you can also enjoy his contribution to cinematography in general for movies like William Wellman's West for the Women or Bad Day at Black Rock. Also his contribution went beyond just Hollywood because much like George Stevens case he joined the US Army photographic unit and got to shoot significant wartime footage during World War II. As you can see there is much to love and much to be excited about when you watch Too Late for Tears, a movie that I really really like and that I hope you will enjoy too if you haven't discovered it yet. And with that I finish today's video. I hope also that you enjoyed it too. Comment down below if you watched too late for tears or if you also love Dan Durier. Thank you so much for joining me today for your love for classic films and film noir in particular and as always take care stay safe I hope you have a wonderful day and see you very soon with another film noir episode. Bye!